Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. And I love to take the time right here uh, on the onset of the program to set the space for our guests. I like to thank them first for their time because I recognize in my life how precious it is. I look and I see I'm now 62 and I want to know where time went. And I know how precious that commodity is. And I want to thank you, Liam, for coming and sharing some of yours. The other is your story that houses everything and so much of who you were. And it has created who you are today. And I want to thank you for coming and sharing that story with us and entrusting us with that information and making yourself vulnerable to us. And I do appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you, Ken. It really is an honor to uh, be sitting here talking to you and um, just being in your your beautiful soft energy is really lovely. It actually helps me to feel nice and calm and centered, which is so nice. Thank you. It's been a very busy day up to now. So <laughs> it's my pleasure to actually stop for a moment and think about how I got here and hopefully that can inspire others to go on a journey or give them some hope if they're right in the midst of a difficult divorce or separation. And when I say difficult, I don't mean it has to be full of legal battle and stuff. It can simply be difficult because you love your partner and you don't want it to end. And all of that does lead to uh, trauma and upset. And it is It is going to get better. So if you're stuck in that space or have been in in that space in the past, I just want to give you a sense of hope that it will get better and you will get through. Uh, We, 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 I'm, I'm a product of it. So I understand and and it does get better. I want you to talk to them about what you have given birth as a result of uh, walking through your journey, the books and all the other programs and stuff that you have given birth to today so far. Mm. Well, it started off with an online, well, actually, it started off with individual counseling and um, then coaching. And from that, I created a program where I actually ran through particular modules with clients to help them really find themselves. And from that, I put together a, an online version so that they could actually go through the program themselves at their own time. That includes videos and workbooks, and it's pretty comprehensive, and it it really does go into a lot of detail, just explaining different emotions and what's normal and what may need some help, typical kind of goal-setting things, because a lot of people actually don't know where they're at after they separate. They're so confused and trapped or stuck that giving them the opportunity to think about where they want to be in 12 months can be very valuable. We look at um, our family dynamics and patterns and how that could have led to where you are now and what to do to stop that. And right at the end, we look at dating again and if you are actually ready to date. So it's a pretty full-on program. People can do that online program on their own. There's nine modules altogether. Or they can do the program as well as work with me individually where we dig even deeper and you can explore what's actually going on for you in a a one-to-one Sort of frame just as we are now online so it doesn't really matter where you are in the world because zoom is a beautiful thing um and i've also been a part of a beautiful uh, book and magazine called feminescence which is basically a book aimed at women but some men have read it as well and, and have really gained a lot of value out of that as well which you know that's a book um, where, where women in business talk about their own story and how they and it's quite inspiring really, um challenged me to, to put those words of my story to paper it's it's certainly very different when you talk about it on a podcast or to your friend or whatever as you know writing it and, um, yeah. putting it down like that and knowing it's going to be there forever um, <laughs> a witness against you if you will <laughs> yes, exactly exactly and I'm going to admit to you all that when I read it after it was published I was thinking oh god I didn't really enjoy that at all, but then I had other people read it and go, wow, that was so powerful. I was like, okay, maybe I've just been a bit too harsh on myself. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of us, because I did the same thing after I wrote my books, um, I, I read it once after. <laughs> I never touched it after that because it was inside of me for so many years. And so 
uh, when I um, released it uh, through um, finding the time to write it and, and put it down into paper. Um, it was such a part of me that I knew it. And I just, you know, it was, um, it took some time to do that. Trust me, it didn't just happen to happen you know, like that was a trip. But that's another yeah. story. So here we are, Leanne. Talk to me about your childhood, because I believe this is where, and I, and I say this from time to time, I believe that this is where a trauma or several traumas happen to us. Mm-hmm. And as children, based on how we interpret that trauma, we will then make a statement. We will, we will say something. And it may be an internal conversation or it may be a verbal uh, outward conversation. But whatever we say at that moment will guide us through our lives for a, me- me- a very long time because we have just developed a coping mechanism, if you will, for yes. us to cope and manage the trauma. And then we move through it. And then as we get older, yeah, that's when mm-hmm. all the stuff starts showing up and we got to go, oh, man, I got to fix that. So Absolutely. talk to me about your family. How was your upbringing with your family like? You know what? It was pretty unremarkable. Not a great deal happened. There was no abuse or anything like that. However, for, for some reason, I'm an anxious child. Uh, my mother did have postnatal depression after she gave birth to my little sister. So, you know, that could have contributed to it because she was obviously withdrawn and not uh, as she would have liked to have been. Yeah. Um, my dad was often absent in terms of working or um, the pub with his friends, which was what pretty much all guys in Australia in the 70s did. So that was not unusual for me. Um, however, my dad was a, a German man with a very deep voice and he was a very man as well. So. For some reason, I interpreted that as really scary. I had a very gentle nature and yeah. his big masculinity was scary and, and he could just look at me or say something in the wrong way and I would cry and my poor dad would be like, why are you crying? <laughs> and really it wasn't until I was a teenager that I realised, oh, my dad actually isn't all that scary at all. Well, why, yeah. what, why did I think he was scary? Um so I was very withdrawn my whole school life, my teenage years. Um, I relied on my friends to be seen. I was uh, not really referred to as myself, but referred to as my best friend's friend. So, you know, <laughs> I was just, oh, you're Debbie's friend sort of thing. So I wasn't really my myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it was really interesting. Um, but really, you know, I know a lot of people have been through a tremendous amount of trauma and I haven't, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't, that I was perfect from anywhere near it. Uh, still very anxious and back in the 70s and 80s, anxiety wasn't really a known thing, so I, I never got any help from that. I went to lots of doctors for stomach aches and chest pains and this and that, but of course there was nothing there because it was all yeah. up here. Um, yeah, but that's traumatizing so though, uh, Leanne. Oh, yes. I think the degree of trauma can vary based on the parenting style of the parent, but mm-hmm. uh, an absence, the father or father not there, or a young girl's perception that her dad, because of his status of um, scary, can cause tremendous amount of trauma in a, in a young person's uh, being, uh, regardless mm-hmm. of nonviolence and all the other aspect of it. That doesn't uh, trauma is not always that. It is the interpretation of your situation as a young individual, even mm. as an individual. When you get older, uh, you yes. tend to have a clearer understanding. But as a young individual, you don't know. You just have the emotional piece that you grab onto and you make yeah. your assumption based on that thing. And you may not be in a violent situation, but trust me. That is trauma because it has just damaged the human spirit and uh, it will manifest. So it's not a matter of degree as far as violence. Trauma is trauma, man. That's how I look at it because it will affect you in any case, whether it's a violent one or a nonviolent one. It will bear fruit. So don't worry about it, Carol. You're good. (laughs) (laughs) And I know you get it, but I think it's important that the listeners get it too, really, isn't it, that uh, it doesn't matter how 
how bad the trauma is. It is certainly the way we interpret it and that does yeah. affect our well-being and who we become. Yeah, I think it, that's the important thing because once it hurts the human spirit, regardless of what, how it showed up or how it comes or whatever it is, it is still yeah. trauma because that person is in pain um, uh, as much as any other person that uh, has a, a violent or even a more traumatic, a, a deeper thing, but it's still at the same effect when you look at it. Yeah. So here you are, this young girl that um, is traumatized, and we see it from the, your your conversation, how you're speaking. How did you manage within your school, because you said you were there, but not there. How did that make you feel as an individual of being there, but not there? Yeah. Well, it didn't make me feel good. <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I, I became more and more withdrawn. Um, I kind of hid in the shadows in a way. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, I went to an all-girls school and there can be a lot of cattiness going on at all-girls schools. So um, I kept very much to myself uh, and my little group of friends and I didn't really talk to the boys from the other, the boys' school and I didn't put myself out there in any way. So um, I was like the good girl, the quiet good girl yeah. who sat in the corner and didn't bring any attention to herself in any way. Yeah, they say things about you guys, you know, but I can't say it on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me later, Ken. <laughs> so here you are, this young girl uh, walking through and, um, you know, being separate, if you will, and yes. uh, in school. As you move through life and you are uh, beginning to grow and uh, become more um, expanded, I guess, if, if you want to say that, in your um, contact with people outside of your family and so forth as you're moving yeah. through your life. Um, what, as far as college and so forth, what made you pick the, um, that uh, course of study versus any other course of study out there? What yeah. was it that prompted you to go in the direction that you went into? Well, I always wanted to help people, um, probably on a very deep unconscious way. I was trying to help myself and understand mm -hmm. myself and others around me. Um, I actually started out first year doing social work and then I quit that to get married when I was 20 years old. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I was 30, after 10 years of hearing that there was something wrong with me, all of my marital issues were mm -hmm. my fault. I went to see a psychologist. In my mind, I was seeing a psychologist to shut him up because it was all his fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but in that one session, I decided I was going back to university and I was going to study psychology. And uh, he really wasn't happy about that. But I love the idea of being able to sit down with somebody one-on-one -on -one and really digging deep to find out what the problem is and making a massive change. Uh, and that's what led me to studying psychology. And then mm. when I finished, I felt like there was still something missing. So I was always on this search. I, I tend to trust my gut. Um, most of my 20s, I felt like there was something missing and I was on the wrong path. I just couldn't figure out what on earth that was. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that led me to going to different workshops and things. And I discovered coaching. And I really loved the idea of coaching as an addition to psychology. So it's just a different way of looking at things. Uh, so now I'm a registered psychologist here in Australia and I am a qualified coach. So when I work with my clients, I can put both of those things together, which I think is an amazing uh, tool to have. Yeah, that's uh, a great combination. That, yeah, through all of that, I really did heal myself because all of the trainings that I did, we had to participate as a client to be able to uh, get what we needed in terms of our qualifications and to understand where we were going. And I'm a very big believer that if you're going to be a, a coach or a psychologist, you have to do the inner work yourself first. Uh, and if I hadn't done that, I would be in my way. I certainly wouldn't be talking to you because I would not <laughs> put myself out there. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, I would say this, I was in the healthcare and, um, 
the onboarding process as the department head, I would have to come and present, uh, do my, represent my department in uh, marketing. And I would tell all of those new folks there. And even when I was in managed health care, I would tell them, I said, this industry will sh- expose you. And we will eventually get to see who is in this business for love or who is in this business for money. And it will show up easily because those that are in it for the love of it, um, you see them shine and their language is different from those that are in it for the money. And some people, Leanne, are in it for the money. They don't. There, I've met quite a few of those that are yeah, uh, carrying the title, but they are not shallow. They're shallow as ever. They're not deep, if you will, to yeah. um, where someone can dive in and gain tremendous amount of insight. They have book knowledge, but they have no experience. And to have both like you, that makes your word release. Once you release your word to one of your, your uh, clients, if you will, it is coming from a place of power, of a place of authority. It's not book knowledge. It's a mix of both experience. And I call it experience and the lab. You have both. And when you put the lab and the experience together, you have yeah. some incredible stuff. So, yeah, I, I get it. So here you are in this relationship that is a wonderful um, place to get to learn about <laughs> um, people's opinion of you, which differs from yourself and what you feel in the inside. As you were getting some of those exchange within that relationship that you were in, what was happening to this person as far as your being, being in this relationship that there is love, as you said, when you, you love someone, but how they are treating you is differ from what love truly is. So talk to us about how you were handling yourself and managing yourself in that stew, if you will. Mm. Well, I didn't handle it very well. You know, I was very young. I went straight from mum and dad to being married. And really what happened is I went from one controlling relationship, as you know, being a child, um, to another, where I felt like I didn't actually get to grow up. And he knew what he wanted and he knew how he wanted it and when he wanted it. And so I kind of went with the flow of, of him, his flow, to keep the peace. And I lost myself more and more in that. You know, I changed the way I dressed and the jewellery I wore and the way I did my hair because he wanted me to have long hair and he wanted me to wear this sort of clothing and not that sort of clothing. Um And I I found myself becoming quite suicidal towards the end of it because I just could not be me and I didn't know how to get out of that situation. Um, You know, I had two young children as well. And so it was really difficult to find any expression on myself at that time. There is a reason why I asked you that question because I wanted to pull that out of of you. We gravitate. One of the things with human nature that I've learned is that when as a child and as a young individual, we find ourselves in relationships as we move through our life, similar to what we experience as children. And it is, I believe, it's simply because we are accustomed. It's familiar to us. And because it's familiar, it's easier to walk into in the sense where we walk into relationships, like you you had said, a controlling relationship, because, you know, most of it, we are familiar with it. And um, we learned how to manage ourselves back then. And so we are, you know, I think it's just in there. And it's just because we are moving automatic, we are on automatic, we're not questioning anything. And so because we are on automatic, we find ourselves 11 years later, where we start waking up slowly going, Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm here. But we realize that we have several children. Um, we don't know where to go <laughs> and things began to, um, wake us up and we realize I'm in the same situation when I was a little person. And, mm-hmm. um, that revelation is a tremendous thing, but that's just my assumption. I, I think we live on automatic and because we live on automatic, 
we find ourselves in these crazy uh, situations. So here you are, you are uh, doing all of these things to please your partner and not getting any reciprocal uh, feedback and you are dying because that's what happens to you. Because I remember in my situation, I was driving, Leanne, I was driving in a car, coming back from some corporate America meeting I was in and I pulled over my car in the middle of, of the highway. I pulled over in the highway, got out of my car and started screaming, I am not going to die. I cannot die. And um, because I knew in the car, I was I was uh, thinking and, and talking about the things that would be necessary in order to make the relationship work. And I knew that I had to die. And I stopped my car and yelled, no, I am not going to die. And I know what that feels like. So here you are, you're gaining some insights because you're older now, you're, you're taking the courses, you're learning of you. Talk to me as you are beginning to learn about you, because that is the purpose of any journey. As you begin to learn about you, how did it now start to affect your relationships around you? In a lot of ways, it wasn't just my husband, it was also my friends that I had to look at and look at how I had uh, given myself away in a sense with them as well. Uh, yeah. Some of my friends I still had since childhood, so, so we knew each other as we were back then, where you know, there was a pecking order. And I didn't realise that they did not still see me like that because I still saw myself like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Through all the learnings I was doing, I realised that I had to make a change, I had to cut these friends off or I had to talk to them and change the situation. And I chose to talk to them and there was lots of tears, lots of hugs, Lots of, oh, my God, I can't believe you feel like this. We don't see you like this. We see you as a beautiful, strong, independent woman. And internally, I was feeling like this crushed soul. It kind of made me realize that I had not really expressed myself to my girlfriends uh, at all in terms yeah. of how deeply upset and, and hurt I was by some of the things that had gone on, on with us and them. And even about what had been going on with husband and I, because I didn't have the right language for it at that time. I didn't know how to say I'm fantasizing about driving my car into a truck or I'm fantasizing about running away from home and, and do I take the kids with me or do I leave them here? How can I do this? Where can I go? All of this stuff that was going on for me. So I kept all of that to myself and it was through working on myself that all those thoughts suddenly disappeared and it was such a relief but yeah. uh, I came to realize that I didn't want to die I just wanted the pain to stop and I wanted I needed this relationship to end but I was too scared to end it yeah so um the learnings that I did gave me the courage to finally say I'm done I can't yeah. do this anymore yeah it is um the journey is 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 a painful place but it's a beautiful place as I said on the onset birth is messy we try to clean it up in the hospitals and all these places that we go and they try to make it as sterile as it is. But I was there for the birth of my children and I saw it was messy um, and uh, um, very, uh, you know, organized madness. But it when there's a process to that, all of the things that the nurses were doing, there is a process to it all. And uh, my children are grown men. And I am in love with them even deeper. As an individual, I see the greatness that resides in all of them. And so mm -hmm. as um, you go going through and you recognize the value of you, you have to make some hard calls, if you will. Because when that person doesn't see that value, um, there is no union that is strong enough to maintain that. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know. I, I don't see unless those two people come together and make a deeper covenant to grow and move forward together, stuff like that. I just don't see it. And not many people yeah, have the courage to take that journey and to grow like you did. So once you made that decision, because that is a dark space to be in, because it's yeah. not just you. If it was just you, yeah, you would have bounced and all that stuff, as they say. But you have to have the needs of the children in as you navigate through it 
but you shouldn't allow the needs of the children to keep you in that mess. You, you shouldn't. So now, how did you navigate in that once you have decided within yourself? And I tell people when we make, I call them statements of faith, Leanne, meaning that you believe what you said more than anybody else. It'll cause you to do things. When you made that decision, how did you exit and how did you feel? I felt immense relief. The hmm. first 24 hours I was on a high, like, oh, my God, I finally did it. Um, yeah. And he knew it. He could tell instantly that we were done and that there was no yeah. hope for him. And he was very um, graceful in, in, in that. And suddenly all of his controlling behaviours kind of changed in those first few days where he uh, agreed to move out and he went and stayed with his dad and I stayed in the house with kids. Um, and, you know, my parents were actually living here in a, a small, we call them granny flats here. So, you know, my parents were there as well, just my mum at that point actually. So part of the catalyst for all of that was when my father passed away and my husband couldn't support me. He was just emotionally unable to cope with it himself and so he couldn't support me and I made I realised then that if he can't support me through my darkest days, then why am I here? Yeah. So I remember telling the kids we told them together and um, – Many years later, they told us that was the worst day of their lives. They were nine and seven at that point. But right. now both of them say it was an excellent decision. And my daughter in particular, who's 20 now, has told me on more than one occasion that she's so happy that we left, that I left, because she can see how happy I am now. And it's given her so much courage and strength and taught her not to put up with you know, bullshit in your relationship and to stand firm in what you believe in and to own your own power. So, you know, it's an absolute blessing for me to hear those words because I know that if I had stayed, she would have witnessed behaviour that would have taught her the wrong way to do relationship. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons for going, to be honest, as well, because I did not want my kids to see me being treated like that by their father because I knew that was going to traumatise them and they were getting older at that point where they were going to really start remembering things consciously. Um, yeah. I know unconsciously they will remember it all anyway, but consciously they were going to remember it and I did not want them to go through that. So um, yeah. my ex-husband they're, and I they're did learning. Our, our best. Yeah, we both yeah, loved our kids, kids dearly. Yeah, those kids are learning regardless of what you do in every situation, the human is, uh, being is designed to learn and to take in information. You know, we're taking yes. the slightest uh, movement in the body. Um, kids are smart. I remember um, myself, I, I was very introspective and I would be looking at people and learning and people would think I'm, you know, they're not learning, but I was studying people as a young child, you know, and um, uh, they are watching us. Yeah, and they're watching us and learning um, everything. We're either going to teach them about courage mm. or we're going to teach them to accept abuse and um, certain things. So we're teaching them in any case. So you yes. took the courage and you move forward because it does take courage to do that. Absolutely. As you stated, you are excited, this newness of life, if you will, yeah. as you move out from one into another space. Now, I know you're all happy and there's smiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to us about the emotional trauma that now you have to manage because you're going to spend some time by yourself mm -hmm. and those thoughts are going to come and uh, want to have a conversation with you. Yes. How did you learn to start managing those thoughts where you of, man, I may, I may have been a failure I feel this. I'm no, I'm no good. All of those thoughts are coming in because you and I know they are coming and they are coming by the truckloads. How yeah. did you start to manage those thoughts again as you're embarking on this new life? Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I had an ex excellent counselor. Um, she was magnificent. And, um, you know, I had thoughts, have I made a mistake? Maybe I didn't try hard enough. Maybe I should think back. Yep. Have I ruined my children's lives? How am I going to afford to live in this house without him? Um, I'm going to go yeah. bankrupt. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. My mind is just <laughs> going crazy with it all. Um, but therapy really helped me to 
stay on the right path and make some good decisions. And um, she was very blunt with me <laughs> at times, which is what yeah. I needed, very direct. Um, but I don't know how I would have got through it without that. I think I how would have you... stuck for a lot longer. How how did you, what did you discover about yourself within the therapy, both the strength and the weaknesses? What did you see mm -hmm. as you began to peel away, as she begins to ask you these questions? That's how the peeling away comes. How, mm -hmm. when you started discovering stuff, what did you discover and how did you deal with it? I think one of the biggest things I discovered was I had allowed a lot of this behavior to keep the peace, as I mentioned before. And that's mm -hmm. what I did as a kid as well. I did actually, I was the good girl to keep the peace. I didn't want to upset anyone. didn't want anyone yelling. I wanted everything to be, needed it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I would do whatever it took to keep that peace. And in doing so, I withdrew more and more and more from myself. And so she helped me to discover who I am and to find that really powerful person inside who has a voice. She helped me to find my voice yeah. and she helped me to talk about it in a way that was safe. And I guess she actually also helped me to see that, yes, it was an abusive relationship, but I had always pushed that aside. Like, well, no, yeah. there wasn't any hitting. There wasn't any sexual abuse. I'm fine. But she helped me to see, well, just because there wasn't that, it was still abusive. Uh, and it took me a long time to really accept that. I didn't want to accept that. It's, you know, I'm a, you know, your average kind of woman working, blah, blah, blah. I'm in an abusive relationship. Really? Um, so yeah, that was, that was hard to acknowledge. Um, but really good once I did because that then helped me to not go back and not try to fix things again. And it helped me to really set very clear boundaries. Uh, once I realized that things actually got a lot better between us in terms of, you know, child arrangements and that sort of thing. So I still try to make things easier for him at the beginning, yeah. uh, which never worked. <laughs> it never worked. <laughs> it always ended up in a fight or something. And uh, once I stopped doing that and I just let things be, things settled down. Yeah. I, I don't have to, I don't have to make life easier for him. I, I don't. <laughs> It yeah. was okay because he probably yeah, saw started... that in me as controlling behavior. It was controlling. I was trying to help. <laughs> no, I think you you start learning to set boundaries, and boundaries are very important. I tell people. Oh, yes. A lot of people um, are afraid to do that, but everything we do takes courage. Everything because setting boundaries is one of the hardest things to do um, because it is going against your like your personality in a way, because you are so um, the other person where you don't do that. And so when you have to do this uh, new thing, it takes courage. So I want you to talk to us a little about discovering all these beautiful things, Leanna. You have to come to a place where you have to forgive yourself. How was mm -hmm. that? And um, it was a messy day because mine was a messy day. I was crying and all that kind of stuff. I was on the floor and and then it, the revelation comes to me and I started to um, forgive that that person that was back there. And when I did yeah. that, I remember this even a deeper um, acceptance, if you will, of myself where I started to walk a different journey when I started applying those things to this young man that was back there. And I was standing here, but we were having these conversations from time to time. I would invite him to come and sit down when we, when it was something that I needed to address and say, hey, man, I'm, I am sorry. I apologize. And so we walked through together. Talk to me about your journey when you started having these conversations to yourself and forgiving yeah. self and loving self. Very similar to yours, actually. I feel a little emotional thinking about it. It, it came in stages through yeah. the therapy and things that I did and then suddenly realizing that I actually did the best I could yeah. and the younger me didn't know better. The younger me didn't have a clue how to be in a relationship successfully. She was pretty much operating from the wounds of her childhood and trying to fix the wounds of her husband's childhood. He had experienced a lot of trauma in his, his life and and I understood that, and even though I didn't really understand it at the time, I thought I did. Yeah. And so I would make excuses for his behavior, 
you yeah. know, because sometimes he could be amazing. Yeah. Um, and then when I really saw myself as this wounded person trying to do relationship, that's when I was able to forgive myself and acknowledge what I had been trying to do and thank myself for making some really good decisions in leaving and getting the help that I needed and sticking through it. Even when there yeah. was times I was crying because I could not afford to do a, a, a course or something that I wanted to do, but I really wanted to do it. And I was really scared to do it and I did it anyway. And it always worked out. And I was really grateful to myself for, for just pushing through because one thing I have learned about myself is that when it comes to wanting to do something, if I want to do it bad enough, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. And, you know, I don't let money become the object. I just figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah. And it I'm grateful us, to it, myself for becoming that person instead of, you know, always being told you can't spend money, you can't do this, what are you doing, all this sort of stuff, you know. So it was a big, big shift for me to finally go, I can, I can make this happen. Yeah, the, it's the limitations that they, we have to overcome. Um, there's a principle that I, I grew up in the church. There's a principle there that always stuck with me. All things are possible to the man who believes. Mm. And then I saw that and I said, wait a minute, the limitation is not, has to be me and how I think. So then when I recognized that, I started to expand that. I started to push the limits and we call it faith, if you will, and in, in the uh, religious circle. But it's mm. belief and all of these things that you're expanding your trust in yourself and beyond the comfort. And so as you were doing, expanding yourself. The limitations will always be there. But what's beyond the limitation? I, I, I'm curious. I want to know. So I will, I will push myself to it because I think we are deeper than, much deeper and more powerful than what people teach us and most importantly, what we teach ourselves. Yeah. As you begin to learn uh, you know, and you get in there deep and you uncover all these things and you are now walking, beginning to, you're stumbling, but you're, you're here. And I tell people that's a good place to be. You're yes. stumbling, but you're here. It's exciting. It's uncertainty, all of it. As you're going through all of that stuff, what was still happening to you, Leanne? What was happening to you and your children? How was your relationship and the changing of yourself and the stumbling and all of those things. How was you managing it and how are you managing your relationship around you? Wow, what a great question. Um, I have to really think back on that now because I've since been in a fantastic relationship for eight years and I haven't really thought about that in-between stage. Yeah, that's a critical place, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. You know, I always put my children's needs I'm going to say second because I I understand the concept of yeah. really looking after yourself so you can look after your children and a lot of parents yeah. don't do that and I really want to encourage them to look after themselves more and not put their kids' needs above them. Um, yeah. So I kind of put us on an equal playing field. Sometimes I had to come first and sometimes yes. they had to come first. Yeah. Um, it was always a learning. There was always so much to learn and I, I remember feeling really proud of myself when I'd get a text message and I'd want to respond in some way that was going to make things worse, and I didn't. And to me, that was like, yes, there's a win. I'm growing as a human being. <laughs> that was always so nice. And through all of that, I was still working with my clients, and I could see that the more I grew as an individual, the deeper I was able to take them in their therapy as well and get really much better results. And, of course, also I was more experienced as the years went by as well. Yeah. And it was a really good thing to, to see that growth in myself and how that actually related to the growth in my clients as well and the growth in my children. Yeah. I took them both to a couple of therapy sessions as well after our mm -hmm. separation. I wanted to give them a voice where they didn't have all their data. It could be a, you know, a, a separate person. And I think that was really helpful for them as well to just be able to express how they felt and their anger and frustration and sadness about the whole thing. That's a great gift to offer them. So here you are, you're going through your learning, getting deeper uh, between 
you and your clients. Uh, as you begin to see you, you begin to see them. And I think that is the key in life is if you can't see you, you can't see them. And I tell people, you can't love me unless you love you first. You say it, but you have yes. no benchmark as to show me that it's, you know, it's real stuff. And your behavior will expose the fact that you don't know what you're talking about. But mm -hmm. um, how did all of that, and I can see it naturally because I, I've, you know, uh, I've asked these questions before. As you began to work with your clients and yourself, you started to adapt certain principles to fit into your space. As you were collecting the data, if you will, what prompt you to say, okay, I need to put the data into a format, which we call a book, um, because you're doing the data, you're collecting it on yourself, you're collecting that information on your, your patient, and you're seeing an outcome, if you will. So you're having this lab that you're working in. As you began to work in your lab, what prompted you to say, hey, let me put this in a book format? Well, to be honest, it was because the publisher um, contacted me. Um, nice. So, yeah, the book that I'm in is uh, a book where there's a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. I think probably what's more relevant is I put all of that information into the course that I created. Yeah. And that started because I was out there on the dating scene and I could see how hurt so many men were. Um, some of them were just downright rude and hurtful. And here they are trying to date. And it was very fortunate that I was a psychologist because I was able to just go, whoa, <laughs> you are not ready to date. This is not my problem. I'm not taking this on board. But a lot of my friends who were also in that space at the time, or they were not able to do that they were kind of more in the space of what's wrong with me why do we attracting these people there's no good men out there all that sort of whereas I went you know what I actually have the capacity to help these guys if they want help so yeah. that's when I started doing the divorce coaching because there's a lot of people not just men but women as well who are dating when they're clearly not ready to be dating and I, I put this program together to help them heal so that they could stop hurting other people with their own hurt and be ready to date. Like people should not be dating when they're so angry and they're so bitter and they have so much hate in their heart. You're never going to attract anyone of substance or quality when you're like that because people are just going to see straight through you and run a mile. And it's important to as you mentioned, Ken, it's important to actually love yourself so that other people can really love you and that you can love them back. Yeah. So that's that's how it all really started in, in that format of wanting to really help men because there's not enough support and help for men out there. And I knew that if I could help men, I could help their kids, I could help women that they started to date afterwards, I could even help their ex-partner. And, you know, there's a big flow-on effect. You don't, you know... By me working on myself, it had a big impact on the people around me and they commented that I was different and it was great and it was great. And um, helping others like that is the same sort of thing and, and then that expanded later on to working with women as well because I could see that, well, you know, what? there is a lot of coaches out there who work with women and I actually love working with women and I'm, I'm doing myself a disservice here by not working as well because they're a different energy and I really enjoy yeah. it, so why not? Yeah, men, um, and I, it's going to be, <clears throat> some of it is cultural. Men don't want to admit that they are broken uh, yeah. because, um, you know, they teach us, uh, they program us that if you are broken, you are weak. And um, we tend to hold it to our detriment because it destroys us. Um, I, anytime I came out of a relationship, I would, I would heal before I even attempt to go into another one. And people mm. used to look at me and ask me what's wrong with me. I, I would not date for maybe about a year or two years, depending on the length of time it took me to heal, because I would look at that person cross-eyed when they come into my space <laughs> and start acting all kinds of weird. And so I was mindful of my behavior, so I would not do it. And um, I had many friends that will the serial daters or the serial relationship uh, folks, and I would call them Klingons, where they just, just got to be with someone. And I'm like, how in the world can you do that? Because mm. I understood 
I know that I could not do that because that would be damaging them, as you said, and damaging me. How in the world am I going to ever heal? It's just one wound on top of another wound. Um, yeah. That's not a pretty sight at all when you think of no, it naturally. So, um, Some people are period. afraid to be alone, unfortunately. Yeah. Most of our society is afraid to be alone because the journey demands that you be alone. <clears throat> you have to separate yourself from friends, from families, from everything else, from TV sometimes and f phone. I had to shut my phone off. There are periods, Leanne, when I was, because I was in corporate America and every, my phone was always buzzing and I would shut it down. There were times I would disappear for days. No one would, I wouldn't answer anything from anyone. And my family knew that when I did that, and my friends knew that when I did that, it was everyone needs to stay away. Um, and I had to learn how to delegate those things in the corporate world to other folks and um, uh, to find some peace because people are not interested in giving you peace. And so you have to find your own. As you began to move through and you saw the need and you created the space by which men can come and, and those men that are listening to our conversation, find help, um, get help. Leanne is here. She started it. And so she's familiar with the energy that you have, and she will know how to, as you speak, she will know how to interpret that energy and how to guide you. Um, you need help, get it. Don't be this macho guy that um, is absolutely out of his mind. There's nothing, there's nothing handsome or gorgeous or anything, as they say about that. It shows weakness, and women could see it. They could smell that a mile away, guys. So don't yes. do it. Find the help. And it's not anything more attractive to a woman to see a man recognizing his weakness and getting help. So find it. Uh, the women that are there. is sexy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the women out there that you know, just push him and send them to to Leanne, give him a book, buy the book. She has his book, but get them into the class so that they can heal and become the best human spirits while they're here. So talk to us about this beautiful woman. You've got your relationship together. Life is good. You are in a space of a servant. And I tell everyone, get there because it's a different lifestyle. Leanne, talk to mm -hmm. us about one of your clients, when you bring them, if you will, one of the trusted spirits that are before you that have come and trusted you because they feel safe. Talk to me about when in a conversation, when you began, when they began to, as they say, when the revelation begins to creep into their mind and they, the light bulb comes on and they finally see the greatness in them. Talk to me about one of those how did you see it? Because it is a precious place. It is holy, I think. And um, yes. how did it make you feel? And how did that person, once they got it, what did their life look like after that? Oh, God, you have such a way with words. I just got chills. Um, <laughs> I love that moment so much. And, and it's probably what really keeps me going in this space because it can be really difficult to hear all these horrible stories that people are going through with their ex-partners and not seeing their children and the like. But I'm thinking of two two people, a man and a woman. The male uh, was late 50s, had never done any real work on himself, didn't really understand the concept of boundaries at all. And when he finally got it, his whole life changed. And yeah. he came in one day... This smile, ah, oh, was so nice. And um, he had changed the way he was behaving at work, which very quickly led to him getting a promotion. He had made all these amazing decisions in his life for himself based on what he wanted and not on fear, which is what was going on before. And he discovered that he was actually a really nice guy. <laughs> and he wasn't all these horrible things that his wife had been telling him for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he actually started to find himself again and it was magnificent to watch him grow like that. And the lady was, hers was more of this amazing spiritual growth that happened. She, she was, both of these people were in um, abusive relationships actually 
And for her, finding her feet meant she had some space where she could start to meditate. And I had to encourage her to do this because I could really see it's what she needed. Yeah. And she stopped um, drinking and she was doing a bit of drugs and this sort of thing. And she really found herself and she found her inner voice and she's quite spiritual and she knew it but didn't know it. And yeah. once she slowed down and really gave herself the love that she needed and the time that she she connected to her higher self in such a profound way. And again, it just, just made my heart sing to see her find herself in that space. And it was so unexpected for both of us yeah. um, to see this, this come out. And these are just two examples of how when people really stop and dig deep, Divorce and separation can be an, an absolute opportunity to find yourself because all the wounds that we received in that, that marriage or that relationship and, and during the separation, they're really a way for us to heal on a very deep level. Yeah, and, I agree. And it's a beautiful thing. when we, And we need, often need that support, though, because sometimes those wounds are so deep that we can't fix them ourselves. We need a bit of support to help you know stitch up those wounds so to speak everyone that has been listening to this conversation i said it before here is someone uh one of the things that the advice that i give to people every time you're seeking a guide a coach find the ones that have been in the lab and the ones that have had the experience and you can have a conversation and you will know and the ones that have been through there is a certain amount of authority in when they speak about that specific thing. Why? Because they're familiar with it, and Leanne is. I want you guys to get in touch with her, those that are going through divorces, thinking of those things, and seeking help as to learning who you are. I have someone for you. She's right here on this podcast. You guys get in touch with her. Get her books Get into her space as far as the programs that she has for you. She has it where you can do it privately or when you can do it with her as well. Get there, guys. Uh, those that are listening, get presents for those men that um, so they can get it in front of her and get healed. And Leanne, I want to thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. I appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I do too. It was an absolute honor and joy to speak to you today. Thank you.